Hey guys, welcome back. So uh, I'm recording these back to back from last week. So you might re recognize my same yellow plain t-shirt and my greasy hair. <laughs> I didn't tell you this last week, but I was riding my bike and it was a super hot day. So I'm like sweating when I came in to record this today. And I'm like, <sighs> but I feel better now, but I still might look kind of weird. But that's beside the point. You're not here to hear about my self flagellations or criticisms. <laughs> so anyway, let's get into it. Let's just do a quick refresher of where we came from last week. So last week we talked about uh, that progression from raw data up through, uh, what did we talk about? Getting the measures of central tendency, the mean, median, the mode. We talked about variance and standard deviation, what that standard deviation meant, how that related to things like the normal curve and percentiles. Well, we're going to pick up with that stuff about standard deviation. We're going to revisit that a little bit. And then we're going to talk about uh, more about percentiles, and we're going to add in a new thing called standard scores. And standard scores, along with percentiles, but mostly standard scores, that's what we're going to see on assessment results. So the majority of today, we're going to be looking at, I'll explain those things, and then we're going to be talking a lot more about seeing results from the book and saying like, okay, here's some assessment results. How do I actually interpret these? What do they mean? How do I understand them? And we're going to look at a couple examples of that kind of stuff. So that's the plan for today. We're going to kind of polish off the majority of our understanding of how do we actually take a result, consume that information, and then we'll talk now and also a little bit more later about how do we communicate that back to other people. That's kind of our goal for what we're trying to accomplish here. So uh, before we do that, though, there's a couple things, a couple concepts that I'd like you to understand. One of them is criteria reference scores, and one of them is norm reference scores. Depending on the kind of assessment that you're going to be uh, using or giving with clients, you might be referring to one of these two different things. And so I'm going to give you some examples to help you suss out the difference. So first of all, criteria and reference scores, as you can see by the definition, in fact, let me get out of the way again. You can see by the definition, they use some standard of performance or criterion or content domain or construct. These are all different ways of saying the same thing. We're measuring you as the test taker against some other objective measure. An example of this would be like um, the final for this class. You have to get a certain score. Well, that's a bad example. You don't have to get a certain score to pass, but uh, it's against the criterion of what does all the stuff we covered in the class. That's what we want to test you against. We don't care how you relate to each other. We just care whether you know the material from the test all of these content domains, these knowledge domains. Another example is your driver's test. You have to know a certain amount about driving, and if you don't know enough, you're not deemed safe to be on the road. Likewise, the, the national board exam, the NCE or the NMHC, PQX, whatever the other one is, there's, always, there's this other one with longer name, it's like the National Mental Health Counseling Exam or something like that, not even that long, but I always screw it up. Nevertheless, we need to know that you know enough about counseling to be effective and safe and knowledgeable and competent and all those things. So that is against the criterion or the construct of what does it mean to be a counselor? That's what we're trying to test, okay? So criterion reference scores have a lot more to do with you as an individual and a bunch of information or your client and achievement or your client and knowledge of certain competencies or whatever. Um, Examples of that are percentages like on a test. How well do you know the content of this week? A scaled score, where do you fall in the construct of something like cognitive functioning? Cognitive functioning is a construct. That's an important thing to know. Um, cutoff scores like driving or NCE testing, those are all examples of, of uh, constructs or criterion reference scores. On the flip side, sometimes it really doesn't matter how much uh, how high or low your number is, but how that compares to what we consider normal, like depression scores or anxiety scores, or um, we looked at the symptom checklist 90. We Sometimes we want to know how high is, is an abnormally high, because a lot of us have anxiety, but it's one thing to say, I have anxiety, and I have so much that it puts me in this other category compared to everybody else. So when we talk about norm reference scores, what we're talking about is comparing people, okay? Um, the, the reason that norm reference scores are important, or I should say the way we get to them, is that when we're developing tests or when we're uh, trying to understand what does this number uh, 80, 
mean. Remember 80 we used as our example from uh, our calculations from last week? We said 80 is average, but how do we know and how do we use that to compare against other people? Well, if you start giving the test to a bunch of people and you find out that it seems like the majority of people score an average of 81 or 85 or 80 or 72 or whatever the number is, doesn't really matter. As long as we know that number, what is considered average or normal, then we can say, well, that score of 62 means a whole lot different of a thing if we know what normal is. Normal is 80. That's average. So we're comparing essentially people against each other. Okay. The way we do that is we give out the test to a whole bunch of people in a norm group. In other words, remember we use the words representative sample. If we gather a representative sample, let's give, let's actually use a, a little more concrete example here, something like the SAT or ACT. I took the ACT, we'll use that one. If we give the ACT to a bunch of people, kids from the South, kids from the North, kids who are uh, boys and girls, we give them to kids that are Mexican American and African American and European American, whatever, like all these different uh, groups, we have a representative sample. And if we do that, then when I take the ACT, I can say, compared to all the other people, you scored this number, whatever your number was. Uh, and then that tells me something about something. By the way, the ACT, the, what that test is for, it doesn't test how smart you are, although we think of it that way. It doesn't test how accomplished you are. The sole purpose of the ACT is to predict future success in college. And if we know, kids who score higher tend to do better in college, then, then when you're giving that for an acceptance score, it's more likely that a higher score will do better. It doesn't necessarily mean you're smarter or, or less smart than other people. It just doesn't measure that, although that's how we use it. That's how we think about it. So, But somebody will nitpick about that. Same thing with the GRE, too. If you guys took the GRE, that tells you a lot more about your future predictive success in graduate school than it does about how smart you are. But you can see how people would make the stretch to say, who's smarter, whatever. But anyway, um, the issue in norming is geographical representation, cultural representation, et cetera, all these other things. And then there's also this other concept. And these something like this might come up. I, if I want to, if my memory serves me correctly, I want to say that the Flynn effect actually came up on my NCE exam when I took it. I don't exactly remember that or if I'm just making this up. But you'll see concepts like this on uh, study guides and things. What the Flynn effect essentially says is we're talking here about intelligence. And when we're talking intelligence, the way that those tests work is they measure us compared to other people. And we'll get more into intelligence scores. But any IQ score, any IQ test uses the same standard measure or the same standard score. In other words, if you're talking about IQ, you're always going to have a mean of 100 and a standard deviation of 15. Doesn't matter if it's the Slauson, the waist, the whisk, doesn't matter what it is. They all use standard deviation of 15 and a mean of 100, okay? So the reason that's interesting is that we can, because of the way that test or any of those tests are normed, if I get a score of, let's say, 110, I know that I'm within one standard deviation above the mean, because mean is 100, standard, devi standard deviation is 15, 110 would fall between that. If I know that stuff, that tells me of how I compare to other test takers. Okay, that's what norm reference means. However, the interesting thing is, is that if you were to give the exact same test that we use today to somebody in like 1920, that says in the book, there's actual dates, I don't remember what it is, but, but if you were to give them that test, the majority of the population would score way below where we are right now. In fact, the average score back in the 1920s or whatever it is would have been something closer to what we consider intellectually disabled now. Does that mean those people were intellectually disabled? Well, no, but they don't have access to the same cognitive abilities that we have today because as it seems, and this is what the Flynn effect is, it seems like we are progressively getting smarter. Now, we'll get it, when we talk about intelligence testing, we'll get into what smart means. But one thing we know is our brains seem more capable to handle things like memory and spatial reasoning and um, what are all the other tasks. There's a bunch of other tasks like, uh, well, it doesn't matter right now because I'm blanking on them. But nevertheless, it seems like people, and this is what the Flynn effect is, 
that groups change over time and so do the normal standards. So what test takers, test taking companies will do, like uh, Pearson and the ACT, like, uh, I don't know, the people who developed the WACE and the WISC and the, the WASI and all those other tests, what they'll do is they maintain current records of current test takers and we use that to develop new norms over time. So a norm is developed when, it's, when the test is, comes out and then every so years, in order for that to be current, they have to develop new norms based on new information. Now, how fast does that happen? Depends on the test. But sometimes, uh, what just the interesting thing to, to know is that if you have an old a test that was normed in 1980, that is not the same as test using that same test today if it's not currently normed, because things change over time relating to whatever the test is about. So. Probably enough said about that. There's not a whole ton that we need to discuss there. Okay, now let's get back to this conversation about percentiles and standard scores, okay? So I'm gonna bring us back to our uh, picture of our textbook here. Do you remember this one from last week? We, uh, we talked about this. We'll just do a quick little refresher here. We talked about this is our normal curve here. And remember that here's our mean, whatever our mean is for, for what kind of data we're talking about. And then one standard deviation above is this line here. One standard deviation below is this line here. We know that 68%, 34 plus 34, 68% of the population is gonna fall within one standard deviation below and one standard deviation above the mean. We know that. And then we also talked about what these percentiles mean. Okay, so we're gonna, we're gonna dig into that one a little bit more. We're also gonna add this information about standard scores, okay? But actually, before we get there, let me, let me just recap again what standard scores are. I'm sorry, percentiles, percentiles. I shouldn't be recording these back to back because I'm gonna muck it all up. But nevertheless, remember if a score, if somebody scores in the 70th percentile, what that means is that 70% of the population of people that took that test are gonna score below that person, and that means that 30% are gonna score above that person. Okay, now here's another one, you try this one out. If, I, if somebody scored in the 26th percentile, how many people, uh, how many, what percentage of the population are gonna score below? I'm gonna pause for dramatic effect. <laughs> it's not really that dramatic, but uh, 26% are going to score below that person, and 74% are going to score above that person. That's how, that's how we use that information, okay? So you'll see percentiles here in a little bit when I actually go to the actual assessment results that are in the book, and we'll talk about those because they'll give us percentile numbers oftentimes. So let's now add a little bit more complexity to our understanding here. Oops, am I camera's all goofy and my book is all weird too. Okay, here is essentially the same exact normal curve. We have the mean in the middle and we have all these other things here. It's probably hard to read these behind my head, but uh, we have Z scores, which by the way, if we take, remember that progression we went from uh, raw data to mean to all the other stuff that we don't care about, sum of squares and all that, to variance, to standard deviation. If I continue on that math train and we're not gonna do it, but if I were to continue down the math train, I could find out things like z-scores. And z-scores by themselves are not terribly interesting because if I said uh, somebody's z-score is negative 0.5, sure, that'd be helpful to know that negative 0.5, if I use this chart appropriately and sort of measure, I could say, well, negative 0.5 is uh, 0.5 standard deviations below the mean. Well, the z-score is not terribly helpful to us most of the time. However, what all of these standard scores do is they give the same scale for us to help simplify the process of understanding what an individual score is, okay? So very similar to percentiles, we can use what we know about percentiles, a certain percentage of scores below, a certain percentage of scores above. The other big and important one is the T-score, and you'll see this come up a lot. A T-score is essentially on a scale of zero to 100, because remember how last week I was saying, well, if the test that our 62-point test taker took, remember that, we used that, uh, that kid in the test he took, whatever, 
we we think our our brains really function for whatever reason uh they function really well when we use the score 0 to 100 because we just understand what that means because we understand percentages and 0 to 100 is just like a really reasonable score and so if we spread out all of our scores between 0 and 100 50 being the mean whenever we're looking at t scores we always 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 know that 50 is the mean but you're thinking Aaron Last week, 80 was the mean. How is 50 now the mean? Well, the beauty of the mathematics is that we can take that score of 80, and we can follow that math train down, and we can say, okay, if mean is 80 and this person's score is 62, what if we translate that number 80 into 50? And if we can turn that into 50, then we can also turn that 62 into a completely different number. Now, the way that this chart is set up, the beauty of this thing is we can say the mean is 80, if we follow that down, that's the mean on a t-scale, a completely different kind of standard score. If we were to do the math, the mean would be 50. And if we follow this line from 62, where that person's score was, and we follow it all the way down, then we're talking of a t-score of 35. Now, if you recall, last week, our t-score, uh, we kind of estimated that it was somewhere around like 36 or something like that. This is the same thing. We can do that same thing just really casually and easily without doing a whole bunch of math. We can estimate or get close to what that actual score is. And when we're talking about 80 and 62, those numbers are a little harder to understand. But when we say, well, I understand a little bit more about a T-score of 35, that starts to make a lot of sense. It starts, to, starts for us to, uh, to be able to communicate about, well, on a scale of 1 to 100, this person... Uh, scored 35 that's that is a number that we can handle a little bit better okay and by the way if we were to lay over this isn't always going to be exactly like this but if we were to lay over this uh this same distribution it's a little harder because they're these ones are closer together than these ones but we could kind of figure out the same thing if we put this up here we could say uh this it's a t score of 35 but a percentile of six and that's how this graph works is we can just kind of go down the line now here i'm going to break down this down a little bit more before i go on explaining uh how how it works a little bit more the z score we don't use that a whole ton t score is extremely important a scale of zero to 100 and a mean of 50 and always 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 <laughs> say it again always the standard deviation is going to be 10. That means 68% of the population is going to score between, on a t-scale, uh, uh, is going to score between 60 and 40, because 34 plus 34 is 68%, and they're always going to score between these standard deviations. Standard deviation is 10, always, okay? Remember last week when our mean was 80 and our standard deviation is 12? Well, if we turn those two things into a t-scale, which we can do mathematically, then we change the standard deviation into 10, which is a lot easier of a number for us to calculate and manage. So that's the whole point, is to simplify and, and make this easier for us to understand. Remember the analogy of bread making? Wheat, flour, dough, bread. If we just manipulate those numbers that are harder for us to get, like 12, into something that makes more sense, like 10, then our brains can capture that. And not only does that make our life easier as clinicians and researchers and students and professors, whatever, but it also helps us explain that stuff to clients as well. So that's T-score. We'll see some examples here in a little bit too. One of the things I told you, I just told you a few minutes ago, I said IQ scores. Was it a few minutes ago or was it last week? I don't know. I don't remember. My brain's apparently not functioning at full capacity right now, I guess. Um, uh, we see this word deviation IQ. Sometimes you'll see the abbreviation div IQ, D-I-V. IQ, the div IQ or deviation IQ is the same exact thing as an IQ score. So whether you see deviation IQ, div IQ, or just IQ, which stands for intelligence quotient, and by the way, quotient refers to uh, multiplication of some kind, <laughs> right? Um, anytime you see that, we're talking about a mean of 100, a standard deviation of 15, okay? Interestingly, you'll see this in other classes and stuff too. Uh, years ago, we're talking like 50, 60, 70 years ago, the, the cutoff score 
of intelligence testing for somebody who had mental retardation, which we now call, it's not the PC word anymore, but we now call it intellectual disability. If you scored below 70, that means that you would be classified as having an intellectual disability. Now, I don't need to go into this too far, but when we talk about incorporating uh, multicultural aspects to all of the stages of the class, Interestingly, if somebody is less educated, they haven't been through as much formal schooling, so they're not training their brain to, to memorize things and to, to understand certain facts about the world, people tend to score lower, which kind of makes sense. However, what IQ scores are supposed to capture is somebody's innate intelligence, not their education. That's for achievement scores, not intelligence scores. However, we know that some part of intelligence scores is captured by uh, our, our education and training. And so a lot of people who are not unintelligent were being called mentally retarded or uh, intellectually disabled. And therein lies uh, a whole bunch of discussion about discrimination and how this disadvantages people, particularly African Americans, before the year of 1950s, 60s, 70s, somewhere in there. So whole conversation to have there. But that's how this works. Deviation IQ scores, uh, are, or just IQ scores, always a mean of 100, always a standard deviation of 15, above or below. And the cutoff score for intellectual disability is just an added bonus fact, which helps us have discussions. By the way, um, if we have these standard scores, that means we can compare one person's scores to the other. That gives us the power to do that, right? That we kind of walked through examples of that last week. So that's part of the reason why we want to do this Oh my gosh, you can't even see this. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I'm like talking about it and you can't even see the dumb thing. Um, that's why we translate these numbers from these various uh, uh, mean standard deviation from raw scores to all that stuff and then to Z scores, T scores, and all these other things. That's why we use these different numbers, okay? Another number that you'll see sometimes is called a STAY9 or what that stands for standard nine. Instead of it being on a scale of one to 100, or you know, mean of 100, whatever, it's on a scale of zero to nine, standard nine. These are all standard scores. Very similar one is the STEN score. You'll see that term sometimes. That's just, instead of it being from one to nine or zero to nine, it's from zero to 10. So why the difference? I'm not sure, I'm not sure, but some test developers thought it would be important to have that difference or it made more sense to them or whatever. You'll see sometimes like different conventions most of the time that I see STEN scores or STAIN9 scores, the majority of those are used in uh, academic settings like um, educational achievement testing or um, sometimes like maybe aptitude testing, something like that. But you don't see those in the clinical mental health world all that often. IQ scores are exclusively for IQ stuff. You'll see uh, T scores used a lot. That's kind of the most important one. So some of these, uh, they're all basically another way to describe the same thing. It would just be, there's just like kind of, I guess for lack of a better term, cultural differences, educational, cultural, educational culture, mental health culture, um, psychological intelligence testing culture, that kind of stuff. So these are all essentially the same thing. And when we use this graph, it can, or this chart, whatever you want to call it, we can tell something about what the average is because the average is always going to be straight down the middle here. And we can tell something about what standard deviation is on that scale. Okay, so we're gonna come back to this and revisit it quite a bit. Let me go back to my PowerPoint here just so we don't uh, miss all this stuff. Um, this, this note about uh, percentages and percentiles, I'm not gonna go into that because it might just confuse us more. There's a difference between percentage and percentile, so Try to use that language carefully, even if you're not sure exactly what the difference is. Um, but there, people get confused about that all the time, especially when you're talking to clients and there's, they're like, well, 95% of the people, because I scored in the 95th percentile, and you're like, no, 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 90, it's not the same thing. So statistically, it can be different, but don't worry about that too much for now. I don't think we need to wade too far into the weeds for that one. Um, and then I kind of talked about standard scores as well. Uh, a way of converting raw scores to be able to compare them to a norm group, that's sort of the technical language. Another way of saying that is it's a way to turn something from wheat to bread. <laughs> that's a dumb analogy. Uh, I mean, it helps us learn, but you're not going to say that to clients. Um, 
Another way to say that is it helps simplify these numbers and turns them from one thing to another so that we can understand them. Just makes them easier. That's another way to say the same exact thing. Um, what I already told you when I was referencing the book is there's several different kinds that basically all mean the same thing from percentile, T-score, Div IQ, all those things. We already just went through those. And I referenced, I didn't talk about these, but the SAT has their own measure. When you say, like, what's a good score in the SAT or the GRE? Well, they have an understanding of their own average scores, and they have an understanding of their standard deviations, too. They just do their own thing. Why? I don't know. They just do it for whatever, for whatever reason they have. Um, uh, and this stuff, uh, I'll just kind of skip all that stuff. I don't have anything special that I want to say about it. I probably should just cut it out of the presentation, but I'm not going to for now, I guess. Okay. There's a couple other things that I'm actually going to skip over and uh, talk about some assessment results now real quick here. So before I get to these, let me go to my book and let me let's see. Is this the one I wanted to? Sorry, I have a few bookmarks here. It doesn't really help very much if you can't flip to that page quickly. OK, let's look at this one first. This one's Got a lot packed into it. It's really small. Can I make this any bigger at all? Holy crap, that's blurry. <laughs> okay, well, I don't want it to get too blurry, and I'm making my camera be all goofy here. I don't want it to get too blurry, and but I want to get close, so I apologize about this, but I have to make it look like this for now. Um, okay, so now that we've had last week, and we've already talked about this week's information, we can look at this thing. You might want to go, by the way, to page 245 and open this up for yourself because these the letters are hard to read behind me and the numbers are small and all that kind of stuff. But we can start to break down this massive amount of complicated, seemingly complicated information into manageable chunks. Okay, so what we have here is we have our normal curve. By the way, what are we even talking about here? We're talking about the Peabody Picture Vocabulary Test. Okay, so this is something that might be used for uh, well, I shouldn't say what the age range is because I don't really know, but a picture vocabulary test could potentially be for um, non-verbal, uh, non-reading people. Somebody doesn't, if somebody knows a different language, uh, people understand pictures a little bit better than words uh, if they can't speak the language or read the language. Um, for children sometimes, so I'm not exactly sure what this test, how this test works, but um, that's what we're talking about here. But we have our normal curve. And remember our 34%, this one actually breaks it down a little bit more accurately to 34.1. Doesn't really matter for our purposes here. Um, standard score is something that you'll see quite a bit. And I don't really use that score a whole lot. I don't do a lot with it. But that's a mean of 100 and a standard deviation of 15 as well. Um, we're just not going to go into that one a whole ton um, just because we have other ones that we use. I, I tend to... Uh, focus more on the percentiles. That's the, the only reason being is that if we focus on the percentiles, we can then talk about how that compares to other people in language that clients understand better. That's the, that's the whole reason for it. So you'll see that term come up a bunch, and we're using it in two different contexts. One, we're using it as all these different ways of explaining basically the same thing, standard score, sten score, t scores, div IQ scores, there's that. And then also you'll see a number represented with the standard score. In this case, it's 109, okay? Remember how that chart that we just looked at, how if you say this is the mean or the average, that's AVG right there. I can also just go right down the list here and go down these numbers and make some sense out of what these are. And what we see here, all these different uh, horizontal lines, we have that standard score, which is 109. We have percentiles, we have NCE, uh, that's not the NCE test that you guys are taking. It's a different thing, and I always forget what that acronym stands for. Uh, but we also have STAY 9s, and then we have qualitative or uh, literal descriptions, language descriptions of what these mean. Okay, Because this one's so blurry, I'm not going to spend a ton of time on it, but I want to point out a few extra things. In fact, I'm going to pull my chair over just to if I can sit down a little bit here. Um, oh, now I'm really going to mess all this up. There we go. Um, okay, so we have our standard score. 
um, we have this person's percentile score. Now this is a percentile of 73. And I know you guys can't see this. I know it's really hard here, but if I go over to my percentile and I go all the way over, and if you can see close enough in your own textbook or even on this one, there's a little dot right there. That rep excuse me, that represents that person's score. Now, just for the sake of example, what does the percentile 73 mean? You guys can pause the video if you want to or think about it. But we know that the percentile means that 73% of all the people who have taken this test are going to score below that person. And 73, per, uh, sorry, 27% uh, 20, of people are going to score above that number, okay? That tells us something. We also can look at our chart, and if we say, oh, she's scored 73, she or he or whatever, uh, and 73 means that's, that's still within one standard deviation above the mean. And so what can I know about that? It's a pretty average score. An average is typically good. So when I'm talking to a client, I'm going to say, you scored in the 73rd percentile. And that's, that's an average score. You did really well. That's something to be proud of, right? Does that mean you're exceptionally intelligent and off the chart smart? No, but you're doing a good job and you're, you're smarter than most people. We'll say it like that. Um, another way of saying that is flipping all the way over here to the description. A lot of test developers will give these descriptive words and just say that for you. Sorry, it's right over my, under my head. Um, instead of, oh, that is blurry. Ugh. Is that any better? Maybe that's better, even though it's further away. Sorry, guys. Um, instead of having to interpret 73 out of, the, uh, out of my smart brain, whatever, I can just look here and I can say, oh, that's within the average range. Now, here's something that I'm going to caution you. It's not really as you can just sort of say, well, I don't understand the math. I don't understand the numbers. So I'll just look for these qualitative descriptions. First of all, you're not always going to get those. And second of all, it's not always helpful to rely on those. And I'll give you an example here in a little bit of why. But it's not always super helpful. Knowing how these things work really gives you a little bit of power. It gives you a, a different kind of understanding that you can that do more with. It'd be like saying, um, well, I don't, I'm not going to give you another example. I'll just move on from there just for the sake of time. Um, now, remember, there's a lot of information on this sheet. And there's this big picture of the normal curve, and there's all these different things. We don't have to know what the NCE is, and we don't have to care what the, what the uh, stanine score is. If we know what percentile is and we can interpret that, that can be enough. We can essentially just stop there, and we don't have to continue on. So when we look at this, there's this GSV. I don't even know what that is. There's the NCE, the stanine. There's all this stuff. But... If we can zero in on the things that we know and the things that are important, if some of this information is just repeating the same thing in different words or different numbers, then we don't need to know all of it. And so that's the point, is that there's a lot of information here, but only some of it's really relevant to us, and the rest of it is the exact same thing. There's really not a whole lot different. So that's kind of helpful to know when you're looking at these charts. Okay, there's a couple other things that I want to highlight here too, and then we'll switch over to another example. One of them is this thing called, and I know this is hard to see, but it says the 90% conf interval. That means it's a confidence interval. This has to do with that thing we talked about last week called error. And if we know how much the error is, we know how confident we can be that this score is accurate. We'll talk about that next week. We're not going to get into this now because it has to do with some concepts that we need to build on more of later. So we'll, ta we'll talk about this. And we'll get back to it. And then this is ultimately going to help us give, uh, it's going to give us more language to talk to clients. Just to give you a little bit of teaser, if my score is uh, 109, the confidence interval, we can figure out what that number is. And we can assume things about if this person took this test again, we can be 90% confident that their standard score is going to fall between 102 and 115. And that can be incredibly helpful when someone says, oh, the reason why I did so bad on this test was because I had a, I got in a car accident before, or I didn't drink my cup of coffee, or I didn't do this, didn't do that, whatever, so I should be able to score better. And you're like, okay, 
but I'm 90% confident that you wouldn't score above 115. So if you think you're going to like ace this thing, probably not going to happen, <laughs> right? Or maybe they're like, oh, I can get my number lower uh, to show that I'm not as at high of risk of something, whatever. So uh, if I just take it again, I, let me try it again. And you can be like, you're not going to score. It's likely that you wouldn't score much lower than that on this test. So that's what that is for. But again, we'll save that for uh, next week, another time. Um, the next thing that I want to talk about is age equivalent, okay? So uh, I'm going to explain what this is, and then I'm not actually going to go into it on this chart because there's another one that I think we can see a little bit better over here on this page on this side. We'll talk about that one in a second. But let me explain what age equivalents are. Okay. Um, there's age equivalents and there's grade equivalents. So an age equivalent, the way this works is that if you see a number 11.4, essentially what we're talking about is uh, somebody in the 11th grade in the fourth month of that grade. So what month do schools usually start? Usually at the end of August. We'll just use that as an example. So the first month would be September. Second month would be October, November, December. So by winter break of a given school year uh, of the 11th, what is that, a junior? So <laughs> during the winter break, at a junior in high school, that's what that 11.4 represents. Halfway through the school year, roughly, in the 11th grade. Age equivalents are very similar. It essentially says, here's a person who's six years old and nine months into their sixth year. So if my birthday is in January, January, February, March, April, May, June, July, August, September, the ninth month, that's a six-year-old who is who is uh, in the month of September if they were born in January. If I was born in February, the ninth month would be October. See how that works? So let's go back to our example here, and I'll show you why that is important. Okay, let's look at this different one. Here again, lots of numbers, lots of information, Let's zero in on the things that we know of that are important, okay? So first of all, again, small, I'm sorry, go to page 244 in your book and you can pull this stuff out yourself if you want to. But we have Tommy J. Test Case. So Tommy is the kid's name. We'll assume it's a, I'm just going to use he just because it's easy for my brain to do that. Um, so Tommy, we know that he is age seven colon eight. And we just looked at age equivalents and it said 7.8, but a colon, a point, it's the same exact thing. Seven, eight. That means he's seven years old in the eighth month. We don't know his birthday. We don't really have to know his birthday. Sometimes you'll see on tests, it'll ask somebody's birth date. And then based on the date that you're administering the test, you can calculate how, what month they're in. So you'll see stuff like that uh, quite often. But we know he's seven years old in the eighth month. So he's roughly seven and a half, we'll just say. We also know he's in grade three. So he's a third grader, all right? Now, when we look at all, the, uh, all of this information, what we have is we have the key math three uh, achievement test. I'm pretty sure it's an achievement test. And we have information on the kinds of stuff they're testing. These are called subscales. The subscale of numeration, algebra, geometry, measurement, data analysis, and probability, et cetera, et cetera. And there's a whole bunch of other stuff that we can look into here. So there's all these various parts of the test, essentially. We also have information on the raw score. Now, remember when we were going through our example last week and we had that kid who scored 62 and we were like, what does 62 mean? How does that matter? Well, I don't know. I'm not really sure how that matters. And the same thing here. I'm probably going to skip over this and be like, okay, raw score, interesting. Until I really know a test, the raw score doesn't mean a whole lot to me. We have a scale score. What does that mean? I'm not sure. We have a standard score. What does that mean? I'm not sure for this particular test. But we're starting to get into things that we can recognize a little bit more. Again, here, this column is confidence intervals. So we'll, we'll pick up on that one again next week, and we'll talk about this again. But we're starting to see things like percentile ranks, okay? Now let's, let's dig into this a little bit more. So here's the subscale of, let's use, uh, we'll just use this basic concepts as an example, first one. If we look at their percentile rank four, 
Rem remind yourself of what that means. The percentile of four means that 4% of all the people that are taking this test are going to score below Tommy. That means that 96% of all people taking this test are going to score above Tommy. Okay. Now, sometimes you'll see people give tests and trying to figure out like, well, what grade equivalent are they taking the test? And this is where we can use the stuff like grade equivalent, age equivalent to find out. Okay. So remember, he's age seven and eight, and he has a grade equivalent of 1.4. What does that mean? Or sorry, he's in grade three, a grade equivalent of 1.4. So what is the grade equivalent 1.4? That's a first grader in the fourth month of their year. Essentially, we're talking Christmas break time. So uh, now there's a, this is where it gets a little technical and it's a little complicated. But essentially what that 1.4 means is that if you take, uh, if you give this test to all of the people who are in the first grade at the fourth month, the average of all those people is going to be the same as what Tommy, how Tommy performed on this part of the test. Okay, let me say that again. 1.4 represents the average of all the kids who would take this test in their first grade in the fourth month. Okay, so um, he's in grade three. We don't know what month he's taking this in. I guess we do here. It's in September, but um, he's in grade three. 3.1 essentially would be his grade equivalent at the moment, uh, chronologically anyway, in terms of time. But how he's performing, he's performing, and this is the language that you should kind of get used to, he's performing the same as an average student in the first grade halfway through the year. That's essentially what that means. In terms of his age, this category talks about age equivalent. In terms of his age, he's seven years old, roughly seven and a half-ish, a little bit more. Seven years old, eighth month, he's scoring as the average six year old in the sixth month. So, in essence, he's scoring the same as a kid one year younger than him, one year and two months. So, these just give us different measures of understanding how does this compare? Because even though he's uh, only one year behind in age development, he's uh, over one year behind in terms of grade development. And those are two different things. So in terms of making decisions about his academic performance, those are kind of important, and they help parents understand these things differently too. Fourth percentile, that changes the perspective. Uh, it seems like a lot different thing than uh, he's just delayed a year, right? Or delayed one and a half grades or something like that, two grades, something like that. So... These are things that if we know what these numbers mean, we can sort of piece apart our decision making. Remember when I said just a second ago, don't rely too much on just the qualitative terms. They're the easiest part to understand. And this one says below average. Yeah, below average, but does that really capture what fourth percentile means? I mean, that seems like a lot below, right? And by the way, this is the fourth percentile is comparing him against his peers not against these people at different grade levels, okay? So that's why they come up sounding seemingly a lot different, right? So uh, hopefully that helps you understand the differences between grade equivalents and age equivalents. Let's, we can sneak back over here and look at this one. Uh, I wonder if it tells us on this test how old this person is. I don't really see that. Oh. Yeah, let's skip this one for now because I don't even I'd have to read into this one and, and see what how old that person is and how that compares to their age equivalent on this test. But one thing I will point out is that down here in the fine print, sometimes you gotta dig for this information. Um, this says the confidence level is 90. Again, we'll talk about that one next week or whenever we get to it. And then the scaled score uh means um this one here. If we didn't, sorry again. If we didn't know what this number meant, like what is a nine, a 10, and a six, how do we even know what that means? Well, we know that an, uh, an average is 10, or a mean of 10, and a standard deviation of three. I know you guys can't read this over here behind my head, but um, you can look at those uh, small fine print things later. Okay, let's look at another example. Now is when we, we've basically covered, I think, everything. Let me check. Yeah, let me, get, let me just jump in the slide, and then we'll go through some more examples. So we covered 
uh, grade equivalents, age equivalents, the last slide, oops, the last slide is um, qualitative scores. And I've already described what those are. Um, here's one for the Beck's Depression Inventory and the scores and how they relate. So you'll, when you get to the Beck's Depression Inventory, I believe it's this week, and you're practicing scoring it and using it and interpreting it, you'll use these terms because people know what severe depression is and moderate depression. Here's the challenge for us, though. When we look at our Beck's Depression Inventory score, we can look at this chart just like any other person and say, oh, well, a score of 32 is severe depression, but the other thing that we then have to do, and this is what makes our lives complicated, is severe depression is not part of the DSM. It's not a diagnostic criteria. So we then have to translate this a little further in terms of clinical utility for diagnostic purposes, because major depressive disorder is a clinical condition, but it doesn't give us quite the sense of how severe or how uh, mild it is. So this gives us a little bit different language, but we can't say you have severe depression clinically, or at least on our reports. So there's, this is where it gets kind of messy, but we translate the number to a word to some other language and so that can make sense in diagnostic terms. So more on that later. But let's go back. This is the last of our slides. So now we're just going to look at some examples here. And I'm looking at the clock here, 45 minutes. So we'll, we'll try and do this kind of quickly. There's not a ton more that I want to show you, but I just want to give you a sense of more practice, essentially, what some of these can look like. Um, I don't want to do this one. That one sucks. <laughs> that one's useful for something else later, but we'll skip over that one for now. Here's another one. I showed you this one last week. Uh, can we actually see that? Feels crooked or something. So now uh, I showed you this one at the very beginning of class in the last lecture because I wanted to show you my crooked lines <laughs> and the high points on my uh, frequency polygon or line graph for all of us normal people. Um, there's a few other things that we can glean out of this now that we have equipped ourselves with more information. One thing we can know is this, uh, this line here. Oftentimes when you're talking about clinical scales that you're giving to people in terms of symptoms or um, diagnostic criteria, one of the things you'll see is something that's uh, basically